the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. My name is Robert Gilson. I direct the Art Center at the 92nd Street Y. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with our programs, the whole Y catalog is available uh, down in the lobby as you leave, and you can find out about the, uh, the really vast range of things that we offer here. Um, I'm going to do a somewhat longer introduction this evening. I have to, uh, to plug a program that's going on next week. Um, a year ago when this lecture was planned, um, the Art Center at the 92nd Street Y had an active and vital photography program. Um, we had nearly 200 students per semester. Um, we hosted nine exhibitions per year. Um, people like Vicki Goldberg and Max Kozloff um, were scheduled to give workshops with us um, this year. Um, we also had a nationally, rised, nationally recognized children's program um, called Red, Yellow, Blue, and Glue uh, that would have celebrated its 25th anniversary this year. Uh, due to the recession, uh, these and many other programs within the Y uh, have been eliminated, and literally thousands of people uh, who've counted on this institution have had to go elsewhere to uh, uh, find um, uh, comparable programs. Um, next Monday, May 18th, the 92nd Street Y will host a gala benefit evening entitled uh, Sheldon Harnick, Fiddler, Fiorello, Fiorello, and Friends. It's very hard to say. Uh, so uh, join us for a trip down memory lane with Sheldon Harnick, the lyricist for Fiddler on the Roof, Fiorello, the Rothschilds, and many other Broadway hits. Um, he's prepared a spectacular show just for the Y for this evening. Um, Frank Rich, uh, theater critic for the New York Times, called last year's 92nd Street Y gala retrospective on Rodgers and Hammerstein, um, in quotes, the most thrilling musical event of the season. Um, always a great uh, opportunity to have that kind of line. The program said, Rich said, was, and again I quote, one of those events that left the audience charged up about the possibilities of a theatrical form that still might take some cues from its glorious past. Um, if you're a regular at the Y, um, if you love this institution and can afford to come, uh, please join us for the benefit. Um, it'll be a great evening and we need your support. Um, there's information on the back, of, back page of the whole Y catalog or you can call 415-5488 uh, for further information. Thank you. Um, our speaker this evening, on to uh, the events at hand, uh, is T Tina Barney, who will present the final lecture in this year's Artist Vision Series. Peter Galassi, Director of the Photography Department at the Museum of Modern Art, will be our moderator. Mr. Galassi received his PhD from the Department of Art History, at Columbia, Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University in 1986. His first association with the Museum of Modern Art was as a curatorial intern in 1974 and 1975. He returned to the museum in 1981 as an associate curator and was promoted to curator in 1986. In 1991, he succeeded John Sarkowski as director of the Department of Photography. During his tenure at the museum, Mr. Galassi has produced several important exhibitions and catalogs, including Before Photography, Painting and the Invention of Photography, Henri Cartier-Bresson, The Early Work, Nicholas Nixon, Pictures of People, Corot in Italy, the er painted, Open Air Painting in the Classical Landscape Tradition, and The Pleasures and Terrors of Domestic, domestic Comfort, uh, and parenthetically Tina Barney's uh, work appears in that anthology. Um, his new exhibition entitled More Than One Photography Works since 1980 from the collection, surveys the role of photography in art as represented in the Museum of Modern Arts collection, and it will open this Wednesday, May 13th. <clears throat> the format for this evening will be as follows. Um, it is our usual format. Mr. Galassi will introduce Tina Barney. Ms. Barney will then present a slide lecture. At the conclusion of the slide lecture, there will be a brief pause while the stage is reset up. Mr. Galassi will then join Ms. Barney on stage for an informal discussion about Ms. Barney's work and ideas. This will be followed by a brief period of questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, please write it on the index card you received upon entering the hall. The ushers will pick them up 
at the conclusion of the slide lecture. As always, your written questions are greatly encouraged. Thank you for coming this evening, and please help me to welcome Peter Galassi. Thank you, Bob. Tina Barney works in what I'm happy to call photography's documentary tradition, as long as you'll acknowledge what Walker Evans ne never tired of pointing out, that the word documentary is a designation of style and not a claim on the truth. When you look at a documentary style photograph, you seem to stand where the photographer stood. If the illusion works, you experience the picture as if it were a whole world set before you. But of course, it's not a whole world. Your experience is strictly limited and thus controlled by what the photographer has chosen to show you. This mighty fiction of documentary photography has been examined and debunked in considerable detail. Less attention has been paid to the implication of documentary photography's other big trick. In the picture, the photographer is absent. For you, the viewer, to take the photographer's place, the photographer must disappear. As a result, the successful documentary photograph erases the most important condition of its making, which is that in order to make the picture, the picture, the photographer had to be in the presence of the subject. How did she get there? And what is her relationship to the subject? These questions have a great deal to do with, the, with how the picture looks and what it might mean. They're always worth asking, and I think they're especially worth asking about Tina Barney's pictures. To begin with, these questions go a long way toward explaining the novelty of Barney's subject, because wealth brings with it the power to control how one is pictured. Photographs of the upper class at home and unguarded tend to be less common than photographs of the rarest and shyest bird of the most remote jungle. For Barney, this difficult problem of access is no problem at all because she is a member of the group she photographs. Her subjects are her family and friends. This explanation of how Barney's pictures can exist at all is also helpful when we consider what they might mean. Even if a sociologist or a journalist or another artist somehow gained access to Barney's world, the resulting pictures would be different from hers because they would be made by an intruder. Barney, on the other hand, is an insider. She photographs her world not from without, but from within. This means not only that her subjects may be less guarded, more relaxed, it means also that she describes them with a privileged knowledge of their attitudes and interrelationships, the meanings of their gestures and expressions, of the things they own and the spaces they live in. It seems to me that this is the key to Barney's work, not merely that she shows us a world that most of us don't know, but that she presents as it world were a knowing self-portrait of this world. That leads me to one further thought. In one sense, Barney's intimate view of her world makes us intimates also as we stand in her place. But of course, most of us are not intimates of this world. We bring other knowledge and experience to the pictures, and as a result, they can never mean to us precisely what they mean to her. And of course, the us contains a wide variety of backgrounds and viewpoints. Since the meaning of Barney's, Barney's pictures must be completed by the viewer, the pictures can never mean exactly the same thing to any two people. This is, this is true, of course, for all photographs and all works of art. But the point is particularly relevant to Barney's work, 
And it helps to remind us that the meanings of her pictures are not nar never narrowly personal, but also always social. Let me take one or two minutes more to mention one other dis distinctive aspect of Barney's pictures, their scale. Barney made her first mature picture, uh, Sunday New York Times, 10 years ago in 1982. And she printed it four by five feet large. By 1982, photography had been showing up in the galleries with growing frequency for more than a decade. And photographers had begun to make their pictures bigger in order to compete for attention on the wall. Most of the pictures that worked on the bigger scale tended to be bold and simple, but that was not so in Barney's case. Her pictures were big, but they used the same vocabulary of precise, seamless description that had become the hallmark of the documentary style. What's more, they did so in color. No one had ever tried quite this before, or at least no one had, had succeeded as well or as consistently as Barney. This was an impressive artistic achievement in formal terms, and it had the effect of enri enriching the content of the pictures, not only because it invited the viewer to enter the space of the picture, but also because small details, which might have been barely visible in a small print, now became easy to read and thus contributed their meanings to the meaning of the whole. Tina Barney will tell you how she got started and what happened when she did. Let me mention a few things she's been doing recently that I think you might like to know about. In 1991, last year, the Smithsonian published a book of her work titled Friends and Relations in a series called Photographers at Work. The book also has an interesting interview with Barney in it. And that same year, in its artist and writers series, the Whitney Museum published a book called Swimming, which combined a story by Tina Howe and nine original prints by Barney. Barney is currently working on another collaboration with writer Judith Freeman about an extended family in India. In addition to her photographic work, Barney has produced a video about the great fashion photographer Horst in 1988 and is currently completing another one on the photographer Jan Groover. Barney has exhibited her work widely, notably in a one-person exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 1990. You'll have a chance to see her newest work next season at Janet Borden's gallery downtown. And now, without further ado, as they used to say, Tina Barney. In 1973, I moved from New York City to Sun Valley, Idaho. I had two little boys, and we decided that growing up in New York was not exactly the most wonderful situation to bring up children in. We moved to Sun Valley not really knowing what was there, and I left a life in New York City that was filled with art, culture of all kinds. I'd grown up in a family that had lots of art around it. My parents were art collectors. And I was uh, ready just to go skiing and not do very much of anything else. Fortunately, there was an art center there, and I started photographing as, just as a hobby. I had been collecting photographs um, very, just on a very small scale and was very much interested in photography, and began printing in black and white. And I'll start off by showing you some of the photographs that I took in 19, 1976. I was in my late 20s and uh, had never really, I didn't have a college degree and I had never uh, even thought about being an artist. This was purely as a hobby. So here, let me start. I did my uh, assignments for the classes that I took in Idaho, but each summer we returned to Rhode Island where I had brought up my children and I realized that I was incredibly homesick and living in the, in the West that was so very different in every way possible 
when I went back in the summers, I would, I would walk around with my 35 millimeter camera and really long uh, for these situations of tradition and ritual that I had really taken for granted and uh, started just trying to record things that I missed very much. I noticed in particular the way that people dressed in the East Coast that was so different from the West and noticed the way uh, just p people acted and sort of uh, moved around each other. I went to weddings and birthday parties and situations that pulled families together and just wanted to record the memories that I had that I thought about so much of the time in Idaho. I was interested in the way that the older people acted with the younger people and the traditions that they kept, for instance, the way, the formal way of dressing and wondered if this kind of tradition would continue. There were so many things that were different, such as the, just the, the fact of young people wearing suits in the East Coast, these seersucker suits, the ties. In the West Coast, people were in blue jeans and cowboy boots. And I also noticed that just the way people stood um, here in this kind of photograph, the way that people hold uh, their hands in their pocket, the, the spaces uh, between them that were so very different, and just would watch them. And go, most of the people that I photographed, I didn't, I didn't make, um, I didn't make them pose for me. I was still sort of a wirer. A lot of the times, um, I, they didn't even notice the difference between me taking the snapshots I had taken in the past. I also was interested in the way that uh, children react towards their grown-ups, whether they still held the respect that I had hoped uh, would remain. And uh, sometimes thought that there was, there was a lack of respect and so the, the, just this relationship between the adults and the grown-ups was something that I've watched and had gone and have continued to go through up until now. I didn't think very much about composition or structure until about 1979 <coughs> when I started taking uh, these pictures in color, learning how to print. There was a new colored pro program that started. And for the first time, I thought about color uh, and the fact that the color sense in the East Coast was so different from the West Coast, and I thought about the structure of my photographs. I was printing these myself. They were small, sort of 16 by 20 photographs, at least small for now, when I think back. But I wanted to be understood, and there was a narrative I had in mind. I had never met so many single divorced women in my life in Idaho, so I thought about myself and my life. I had been married for, um, or at that time, 13 years. And I was very curious about what it was like to be single. I didn't, I didn't really, I wasn't very sure about whether my photographs were understood, so I titled them. For instance, this was called, What Will She Really Do When She Is Free? And, um, you know, I had specific narratives in mind. I, these were strangers. I would find, I watch people and find my place where I stood with my camera and then afterwards thought about what they were about and how they related to what was going in my, on in my life. This was the time of uh, women's lib. I was reading books by Simone de Beauvoir and Doris Lessing. So the idea of being a woman and being on my own for the first time in my life was very much on my mind. In this kind of situation, I would watch people come onto the beach. I loved the way that, pe that families would come onto the beach and find their little nests. And I began to develop a certain palette that was, has become fairly distinctive of my work. I love the idea of matching colors. My mother was a model, an interior decorator, and there was a lot of color around in my life um, all the time. And so the idea of these two pinks matching and the two, two blues matching was sort of much fun to me, just to show that there was a relationship between this family. And I also thought about, about the way this little boy was leaving the nest because my children were growing up and I was, I was watching my life very sort of subconsciously through my camera and just really trying to figure out what was going on. This was the first photograph in which I think I really directed um, one of the pictures in my people. And as Peter said, in snapshots, for instance, uh, people have always directed in snapshots just for the fact that you stand in a certain place when you take your snapshot at a birthday party or just by saying for your mother to stand around and look at you while you take the picture is a way of directing. But my sort of way of directing was for structural reasons so that there was a narrative that could be understood by these structures. So I told my son to stand in between those two little pillars 
And I told the man on the, on the right that you can see hidden behind the tree to stand there and the little girl on the left because I wanted to talk about how I thought there was too much distance between family members. I was very disturbed and worried about the distinct, sort of the extinction of the American family. A lot of things were happening around and it just had to do with where I was in my life. I only knew about structure and composition from Italian paintings. I had studied in Italy for one year in my life, and I was very interested in Italian paintings. And I thought about um, composition from paintings more than photography. The teachers I had at the Art Center in photography referred to other photographers more than painters. And I knew how the Italian Renaissancean painters of the 15th century used architecture and these wonderful lines to bring the eye of the viewer into the photograph or into the painting. And then also use these little divisions such as diptychs or little scenes to, to try to describe the narrative that was in the painting. So this is the kind of situation that I would try to work out. Um, I, w I still was going around with my 35 millimeter camera taking pictures a lot of times of strangers as I traveled, but more and more I had a more um, very exact narrative in mind. For instance, just to begin with, the colors of a situation would attract me to taking the pictures. I love the red, white, and blue of this photograph. So American, so New England. Um, I was very influenced by Robert Frank, who used the American f flag a great deal in his work, even though it was in black and white. But then I also tried to use the devices such as these ropes to try to show that I wanted your eye to be directed to this father that was sort of walking away from the family the family is partaking in an event that usually brings the family together, that is boating um, on a Sunday afternoon. And I also wanted the viewer to, um, no to really notice that I wanted to try to hold the family together. Also, it's sort of trying to string together this woman on the right uh, foreground of the photograph together, sort of tie her together with this man walking down these very strange looking paths that are so indigenous to the East Coast. <laughs> And I thought again about the older, the older sort of the grandparents of the family and how very important they are in keeping the family together. And I sort of um, I had no idea what the relationship between this man and, and this, the older man and this young boy was, but I was hoping and imagining it might be a grandfather and grandson talking together for a while, moments that were precious to me. And here again, I also use these ropes to, to sort of slash across and mark that I want this to be noticed and I want this to be an important moment. Here are the matching towels again, sort of trying to say, okay, this is the family, they belong together. I thought again, here's more about the, the woman, the, the, the single woman who's in this wonderful, wonderful uh, world, and yet she looks quite trapped in there, in that paradise. And I watched this family, for instance, I saw this man and this woman walking on the, on the right away from this man. I watched them, they were a couple. And I wanted this photograph to be about the fact that I don't think that this man was paying enough attention to this woman. And I would also repeat having a tree down the center of the photograph, which I think a lot of times replaced me. That I felt torn, split down the middle. There's a child in the center of that tree. This line of the bricks is going down the center again to show that I, that I want you to look right down into the center and try to also create space in the, in the photograph, which is not easy to do. And then there's also the scale differences of those people out there in the grass back there uh, to bring your eye out. This photograph I still was titling was called uh, Whose Life Is It Anyway? And the, the, the physical uh, separation or spaces between people was always, has always been very important to me. Here's a man and woman, the fence in between. This is in the late 70s still, a single woman staying with that same division down the middle in this sort of diptych, two scenes on each side. And here's the tree, the father, the children, the tree down the middle, standing really for me, I think. And these, in other words, th th there was a decision that I was thinking about. I was torn between making a, a decision in my life. I thought that these photographs were about just people in general, families in general, in general, uh, women in general, <coughs> couples in general. I never really admitted to myself that they were about me in particular. Here's a woman, stone woman, of all the people walking around not noticing her. And at this point I began photographing on a tripod. Um, here I, I tried to show how I wanted children, how the, the family tries to make a nest again as I did on the beach. 
I wanted to, to keep, keep the children in a little nest. I wanted to protect them, wanted to be sure that they didn't go away and fly out of the nest. The nest was, became important to me, and I started thinking about, okay, where was I go going to go on to next? What, what narrative would I think up? And so I thought very seriously about the home and the upkeep of the home, how people take such care in painting the house, cutting the hedges, and fixing the interiors of their houses, and how I hoped that this would tend to keep the family together. I don't know if you've noticed, but the, especially around places like Nantucket, this is all summer long, people working, 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 and wondering why they're doing this, if they ever sit and stop and wonder why. And a lot of times I think it's, if you ask people, they would say it's for the children. We hope that our children continue, we'll keep this house up, uh, you know, when they have children in their lives. So I started photographing the outsides of houses, these wonderful, this wonderful existence that I was surrounded by, because I knew from living in Idaho that, that my life was very different from most of the people I, le I had met in the West Coast. So I photographed the gardens and the, uh, and the insides of the houses and started putting my camera on a tripod to, so that I could have a wonderful depth of field and show the quality of what was going on inside these houses. I wanted to try to take interiors that were different from house and garden, and I learned at this time that you could blow your photographs up two by three feet or 30 by 40 inches, and I started doing that at this time in 1980, 1981. And also at this time, I, I got a four by five camera, I changed from my small camera to show more detail and more quality, which slowed me down quite a bit because it was a very difficult camera to use, it was a big decision to use. and I. I these photographs weren't really what I had in mind, but they were a stepping stone to something I had dreamed about that I wasn't sure exactly what it was. But I was learning how to use it, learning how to photograph inside, which is, I knew there was something I wanted to record and wanted, wanted to do. I also was interested in the collecting of things, the collecting of art, and the, the certain objects that people choose, and how, um, how, how the objects and the interiors of people's houses are very much like themselves. I wanted people in the photographs and didn't have the self-confidence to ask people to, to pose for me yet. And so, for instance, I would use the works of art on the wall to sort of replace the people. And so I began slowly to have the courage to ask people to pose for me with my 4x5. I would clumsily get out of my station wagon. And this, these are the kind of photographs I took in 1981. And they weren't exactly what I wanted. The people are very small. The settings are very big. I wanted the people to be uh, more important than the settings they were in. But this is as close as I could get at this time. And I would, I would sort of very quietly ask them to stay there, but really wasn't very um, ambitious about my directing. Here again, I have the hammock to try to pull the eye in, to try to to uh, show that I wanted the children to stay together, I wanted them to be important, but it also was a kind of a screen to show that I felt that I was intruding. Even though I belonged in this setting, it still, and even to this day, uh, takes a lot for me to say, can I take your picture? I still feel like there's a little bit of intrusion and invasion of privacy. And so, you know, even, even outside, that's as far as I could get. So in 1982, I took this photograph, Sunday New York Times, and this is what I had dreamed of. This is what I had in mind. And it took, uh, you know, a year to get up to this point. And also at this time, I was blowing my, I started blowing my photographs off, starting with this one, to four by five feet. I knew what was important was to find my vantage point, where I stand with my camera, which defines or designates my attitude on the situation. And that's what I still do to this day, is find the space that I think is right. But I knew that this activity of reading the Sunday New York Times was very important to keeping the family together. I had been married for um, about 16, 17 years at this point. I was really at a point where I realized I might be losing my family that I might be on the verge of getting divorced. And so I would find other families to sort of replace mine. I could direct them. I could do with them what I might not have been able to do with mine. And I also battled with the idea that the, the father should be at the head of the family, that this was the way that I was brought up. 
And so the one thing I knew is that I wanted the father or the head of this family to be at the head of the table, and I asked him to sit there. So that was about the amount of directing I did at this point. I didn't even dare ask the young man in the foreground to turn around. And I, so I asked the father to hold still, and at this point, I was, um, my exposures were four seconds long, which is what you had to do with a four by five camera in an interior like this. I had no uh, help from extra lighting. This was daylight. And so I was fairly pleased with this result. I didn't change any of the objects in the room or didn't move things around. Now, I just wanted to show you this because after that photograph, this is the kind of photograph that a family wanted me to take afterwards. And a lot of times, family will say, now, will you take our portrait? Just to show the traditional portrait, the way people through the history of uh, photographic portraiture have lined up in a row, which has gone on since the, the uh, 19th century, and wherever you go in the world, this is how people automatically line up in order to have their pictures taken. Um, this is so that everybody can be visible in the photograph. No one's hidden, no one's blurred, no one's out of focus. And um, I think it's very amusing that people still enjoy to be lined up in that way. I knew that the one uh, comfort that I had in this sort of uh, traumatic time in my life was my sister. She was my best friend, has been my best friend my whole life. She also happened to live on the same floor in the same building that I lived in. And I, with my four by five, uh, found places and situations that I was comfortable with that I felt easy at uh, in being uh, and photographing in. And this was a very comfortable situation uh, that I could walk into. The colors were right. That's always important to me. And there were also structural things that I used to repeat. For instance, this right side falling out at the bottom right uh, corner, which I repeated um, quite a few times and never really wondered why, but I think it's always an interesting twist to have that empty sort of space at the bottom as if not everything is all right in paradise. There are things that can happen and fall out from under your feet. This is more formal and not really everything I had dreamed of, but I think a very interesting uh, photograph. Now these pictures at this time are still four by five feet, feet and always have been since, this is 1983, and I continue to make this size. So I've been learning all this time how to deal with the scale and really wanted the figures to be uh, very important in the photograph, wanted them to be as large and close to life size as possible and always have thought about the color. This uh, photograph was important to me because it reminded me of my sister and myself as children. We were dressed alike. And I just wanted to still mark the traditions that have been kept up um, in, in my background that, that have been there since, since my childhood, which I think is quite extraordinary, the matching bathing suits. And then this very strange structure down the middle again uh, that, I've been, that I had been doing since the, the late 70s. So I would um, you know, try to do portraits of people, show the relationships. Um, sometimes they were fairly formal. But um, I was, I was you know, just working my way into getting this kind of photograph, which I was very pleased with. And I, again, walked into this situation. I would have my camera and my gear in the back of my station wagon. This is why I photograph more easily in the summer resort that I return to every summer. And here the palette, too, that is, uh, people ask me so much about um, attracts me to this situation. There's, for instance, all these colors of the same, uh, same sort of family. All the reds happen to be in this, in this kitchen, and that attracted me to it. And I'm still asking the, the people to hold still. They look a little stiff, but this is the best I can do. And I, for instance, directed this young woman to sit out there to bring the eye out. And here's the table falling out, falling down again, um, which I ke have kept on doing at this point. This is the boarding school, and again, a traditional situation, which I still am in amazement that, that young women still dress like this and wear these uniforms at graduations. And uh, sometimes you'll see earrings in their noses or anklets on, uh, you know, bracelets on their ankles that show the mark of the time, and yet they'll still be wearing these um, traditional uniforms. So in 1983, I started to move closer. This is something that I had always wanted to do. I wanted to become more intimate with my work. And just moving up with the camera took a, uh, a lot of time, sometimes a whole year to get to this point. And the narrative, um, I went back to being able to try to create narratives that were important to me. This photograph was about this man and woman. I tried to show the relationship again with the towels that match. But I also kept on thinking of the composition of the space 
of the light. And these Dutch painters from the um, 17th century uh, weren't what I was thinking of, but when I, when I look back, I think definitely there is a Dutch kind of light and space to my work. Because again, um, through some of the history of art I had studied, I knew this was how you created um, a very believable sort of atmosphere and space in, in your work. I also uh, saw a lot of performance art and dance, which influenced me, and um, the way that, that dancers and um, actors use a stage and are directed to use a stage or chore choreographed on a stage were interesting to me. On the beach, I could be more free, the light wasn't as difficult, and again, the relationships with, between the people are so important to me, and also this sort of one child is sort of floating on the top in her space by herself. Um, is, is the c kind of uh, sort of visual situation that would attract me to this, to this event. And just the, I, for instance, I wouldn't ask anybody to look a certain way, but I was up pretty close. So as you can see, I'm evident to some of the people in the picture. They had gotten used to me by now. This is 1984. And for instance, in this photograph, I started asking people to pose, to come into a room and try to, uh, you know, in a one hour amount of time, to try to move them around and direct them so that the composition would be interesting. I still was photographing families going to events such as birthday parties. And at this time in 1984, I would, if I saw something I liked, for instance, these two women kissing, I would ask them to repeat the gesture so I could um, have the chance to get my act together and photograph them again. So in 1984, at the end of 1984, in the summer, I wanted more. I wasn't satisfied with, with what I had. I, I uh, reached a couple of goals I wanted to do, but I wanted more expression and more human emotion coming from the people in my photographs. So in this situation, I went to this place uh, where my son, son at the age of 17 hung out with his friends because that was a very much big part of my life at that time. And I asked this boy to turn and look at me, and he gave me that expression. That was something I had been looking for and waiting for, and could be interpreted in many different ways. But I also asked the boy in the bathing suit in the red to, to stand on that wall to bring the eye out, and also, also asked this boy to look up at his friend to, so that the eye would wander around the photograph and just have a lot of activity to what was going on. And also, it had to do with the narrative, that I wanted to show pre peer pressure that maybe this boy was saying, oh my God, she's bothering me again, and this boy would look up at his friend and say, see, you're in trouble again. And so I wanted more. I wanted the expression, I wanted the gestures of affection that I felt uh, were so lacking in the American family, but I wanted to be closer. And so this photograph uh, in 1984 was really even more, um, more close to the goals that I had been looking for. And I watched this, uh, this young man grab this little girl with this affectionate gesture, and just the wonderful sort of gifts that I usually get in my photographs that are so wonderful that in the editing I see, the result of, is the other little girl jumping up right at that same time and looking down, which produces you know, even more of a narrative that can, that can go on. I wanted more, I wanted this kind of spontaneity and these kind of expressions, but inside. And in order to do that, I put a flash on the top of my camera in 1985. And that produced some more, uh, some different kinds of situations that I hadn't had up to this time. So this kind of, at this kind of time, I'm asking people to pose for me. I'm choosing the room I want them to be in. I have an idea in mind, and I'll set up a little narrative that really would be something that would happen ordinarily in their lives anyway. This again is about the respect of the, of the adult to the child. So I sort of, I asked the little boy to stand up and look at his father, but that's about all I did. And so this wonderful sort of narrative would happen. But the room I chose was important, the lighting, and again, the flash to help me along with this sort of spontaneous moment in an interior. This was, uh, this was the, uh, a photograph again that I had dreamt of. And it had all the things that I was hoping for. And to, to have, this was at my sister's wedding, to have her half standing in a chair was more than I could dream of. I did ask the girl to turn her head uh, to uh, profile so I wouldn't get her back. I, I liked her being there because her hair matched the walls. I asked my brother to look at my sister. But all the other things that are in this photograph are important to me. 
there's a lot of art in, in a lot of the interiors, and I use those as part of the narrative to sort of point out what I think is important in the story. And if you see the hands of the, of the man in the painting matching the hands of my sister, the, the, the chrysanthemums going through her, hair, her ears like earmuffs, all these things that are accidents but are just so wonderful to make up even more fun a narrative. And the angel in the lamp sort of has a halo the same as her hat to mark this hat and this dress as sort of period pieces to say, aren't these extraordinary uh, pieces of clothing? And um, isn't this unusual in 1985? But also the fact that you can see through her dress as you can see through that little angel's dress, all those little sort of uh, wonderful gifts that happen. And I, it, in the end, sometimes I don't even have time to notice. It's a lot of instinct and timing. And this, I moved up one, sort of a couple of feet after I took that last photograph, the reception. And this, I'm not sure which one I like better, but I think the wonderful sort of, uh, sort of uh, choreography that's going on with the hands, it's just, uh, you know, boom, 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 that's so wonderful and fun for me to look at. And here again, the same situation, uh, you know, another, the same wedding, but uh, to get a room like this with these three young men and their gestures and the clothing and all the things that are important to me and have been since the 70s, and the discussion that could be going on between them, plus the interiors, um, is a wonderful feast, I don't, at least for me, to look at. And these are still, these are again uh, four by five feet. So here again, the painting in the background is part of the narrative. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the lack of the man in this, this photograph replaced by the man in the painting. And so I went to, to using strobes in 1986 because I wanted even more um, a relaxed situation. I wanted to use the space in a different way. I wanted to see what would happen with a different kind of lighting. So here again, I'm interested in the grandfather, the uh, sort of the figure in the family that, that hopefully tends to, to uh, hold the family together. And the grandmother. And then situations like this that I couldn't have done without strobe, to have a whole situation with lots of uh, activity going on, to have the outside lit, the inside lit. But again, um, there are certain things such as this, this dark uh, black space that's interesting to me and that has been, um, such as the child on the beach, and this little girl all by herself stuck there in the bottom is interesting to me. I, I, you know, at this time, people are so, my friends are so used to me photographing that I could go into a situation like this with my umbrellas and with all my lights and almost do what I wanted to do. And these situations with a lot of people were not as inter interesting to me as this, for instance. This was in a small room, crowded, but the kind of things I love, for instance, are these negative positive spaces. The fact that this little hand is bringing up the father's hand to go over and touch his daughter. And her little hand is pulling that ribbon up from the back. And that wonderful sort of um, ambiguity of space. The little girl in the background is quite far away, and yet her hand in the photograph is touching the hand of the father. And here this, this line of the quilt is bringing all the way through to the ribbon in the father's hand and the circle that comes all the way around. And these, the, you know, I oh, I'm only can be aware of, of so much while I'm taking the photograph and after, in, when I see the contact sheets, I see all these things that go together. And uh, here again, this is, a, you know, working with, for about two hours, three hours with friends in their, these are in New York apartments which are different for me and a great challenge. This photograph is different for me too because the coloring is so different. I feel, uh, you know, it's almost as close to a grisaille as I would ever get. But um, also, I sort of uh, wondered if this was a little bit too forced, a little bit too, too dramatic. And yet, I think that the expression on the mother's face makes it seem believable. And these are all things that I can't be aware of be, uh, you know, or sure of until I see the result, and is why I would choose one photograph over the other. So at this photograph in 1987, um, I'm making even more decisions. I, for instance, decided that I wanted this photograph to be in this wonderful coral room, and I asked these two people to um, whether they had clothes that matched the colors of that room. And so this is, makes even more of a, of a palette that's very specific to my own work. 
But I'm also interested in the fact that these colors are very much a part of our time, as the mother and daughter happen to have clothes of the same color. And that all sort of an, is an interesting phenomena to me. I decided the father should be sitting on the floor and the mother should be standing. I wanted the, the photograph to be about teenagers and how I think they have more power over their parents, so I put the teenager in the foreground. But this wonderful expression that the fathers gives is really captured through the strobe lighting and is a wonderful sort of gift. And no way I could have determined that he was going to do that. This, and so at, at this time in 1987, I changed lenses for the first time. I decided I wanted to get even closer up. I wanted to l eliminate the backgrounds, not have so much of these fabulous backgrounds be so much a part um, of the photograph. And I wanted really to concentrate on the people and their gestures and the relationships and what was going on between them. I also wanted less people in the photographs because it was much more difficult for me and for them to get up close, just to have two people. They had to deal with, the two, with each other if there was just two of them. And um, this photograph, um, you know, to me was very difficult to get to this point, which is quite simple, just two people, very close. And uh, to me, it tells, tells a lot about the relationship between this mother and daughter, just, for instance, through their hands. Um, I think that it's a very intimate photograph, and yet some people might think it might have a negative connotation. To me, it's very close and tells a lot about how close they are. Uh, this is Beverly, Jill, and Polly, my sister and her daughter that I took in 1987, and again in, is in a very intimate, close situation. I, want, I decided I wanted to be in a bathroom in the most intimate place you could be. Um, and people think the colors are so amazing. They look as, almost as if I have, had made a set for myself, a theatrical set. But um, I have to point out that a lot of the interiors in my photographs have been done by my mother, who's an interior decorator, or by my sister, whose taste might be inherited from my mother. And that also this daughter, for instance, might have the same taste as her mother in choosing a bathrobe the same color as her mother. The objects, I don't uh, put... Uh, I don't put the objects out. Those, those all are there. They're there to show what, what these people are like, the kind of cosmetics they use. I might move the brush a little to the edge of the table. But things, for instance, where I stand is what's important. And this table, which goes out, again, pointing to the center of the photograph and the line of the mirror going down are all structural sort of devices that I think about. The idea of the window, the doghouse that just has to be there to bring your eye out. But I just want to show you some of the other photographs I took at this situation um, and show you why I chose that first one instead of some of these others. You might disagree with me. But I think, for instance, I try the curtain being closed. I have, I, what I do in this kind of situation, I'll say, well, think about something to talk about. And I have to prod them and say, come on, come on. Now, Jill, you move back. Now, move forward again. Come on, walk through. And I, I am really directing in a quite bossy way. What's important uh, is the space, but also the narrative that's happening. I want some specific kind of um, uh, relationship happening, or to show that something at least is going on between them. That's not bad, but I like the space in this one. And I think this is the first time I've had someone notice that I exist. And this was a very big decision to have the subject look into the camera. But there's also ways that people can look um, at a camera. And I feel as if uh, Jill is really looking at me and not the camera. And I think that was important to me. And that's a very powerful um, sort of, um, let me see, gesture to look into the camera. I had all this time thought that I shouldn't have been noticed. And this is the first time that I really felt it was okay to be part of the, the whole set. So I've been, I'm moving in. This is 1987, 1988. Very close, about a foot or so, or two feet away from the people, um, which is not that simple to do. But I was very interested in, in sort of piling up these figures, as Caravaggio might, and, uh, and seeing what could happen spatially in a very small, cramped space. I wanted... I, took, I had, was much more patient, I took much less time, I had much more confidence. The, these people were much more used to me. They really wanted to uh, partake in the whole um, making of art and collaborate with me. And so um, I was getting to 
a really intimate, I think, intimate situations that I had been looking for for a long time, with much less a activity, so that you had to really think about what was going on between the two people. I worried about bringing the figures up to the, the uh, front of the photograph, that I couldn't create space if I did that, and that was a challenge for me. So I'd use that lamp, for instance, as a window in a Dutch painting, or the windows I had used in the past as a device to say, okay, at least that's some opening or space between these two people that are pushed up in the front like that. And this, then I, I knew that the most difficult thing, I always set these goals up for myself, was to have one person alone. And uh, this is Sheila that I photographed with her daughter in that be beautiful blue bedroom. And um, here she is, very close to me. And it's the first time that I really thought that, it was, that I had made a photograph that was scary. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to do that, but I knew that this was um, part of my friendship, that there were parts about my friend that I was afraid for in her life. And that, so that fit into my feelings for her. And the idea of using the skin for the first time was very, uh, very enjoyable for me. It's something that I had always wanted to do. And this also was as close as I had ever gotten two people to be. Even though there's still a little tiny space between that lovely green line between them, this was very close. And one person, this is Jill, my sister, again, just looking straight at me. I wasn't sure if this was just a portrait. And the idea of what a portrait is as opposed to what I think I do, um, it, it, who knows what that, what that term can be, but this was definitely more, and I, I knew that I want, didn't want those fancy interiors, and I chose the television because I think it's such a, uh, such a, a wonderful sort of um, game to try to work with, and also very much a part of everybody's lives. So I decided I'd use this big television uh, as a backdrop. And just the idea of the, the space, the hands, and the fact of the, the scale difference in these hands, and the how, this is called the sisters, and how these two sisters, for instance, can communicate through their dogs, but there's this sort of uh, tension and space between them, and they probably might not have ever physically touched in real life. I was very interested. Um, I didn't purposely go out and say I want to make a photograph that looks like Vuillard. This is Vuillard's, um, Edward Vuillard's painting of mother and uh, mother and her daughter, but the, the patterns and the combination of patterns in, in, um, in a painting were always something that I loved to do. And also the fact that Vuillard was an uh, he His uh, paintings were about family in interiors, which mine were. And so um, just uh, looking at his paintings really taught me a lot about uh, many of the things that I was interested in. Just the way these arms are spread out, divide the space, and all these strange patchworking of, of fabrics and people, and not being able to really tell uh, who is where and what is going on, but just through the gestures and the way people hold their shoulders, really, I think, tell in his paintings what the people are like and show the relationships between the people, but also this ambiguity of space through these patterns, the wallpapers, the mirrors, the reflections are very interesting to me. And so in 1989, I decided it was time to put myself in my photographs. I knew I was going to do it at some point, and I really had to be ready for it. And I wanted, what, what was interesting was being on the other side of the camera and really trying to figure out who I was or what I was doing there or what do I really look like. And I, this is a picture of myself and my sons in a situation that uh, is very important to me. It's one of those traditional ritualistic moments like the uh, pulling down of the American flag in that first photograph in which my sons would bring out the barbecue. Uh, this is our family sort of dinner table, um, like many families at this time. But I also had to decide what I was going to do. I wanted to think up a narrative without making it too forced. So I decided to point my finger at my son's beer glasses to say, how many of those have you had tonight? And I knew that that was very forced and superficial, but my other son, just by accident, burned himself on the barbecue and uh, sort of came up with this wonderful gesture that's absolutely accidental that I, that I realized when I saw the contacts made this picture believable and really relaxed. 
I did tell the boy in the back there, to, I put him there, I told him to sit there to, again to bring the eye out. I told him to look at me. There's a boy here. And, you know, I do this all in a couple of seconds. This is rushing around, waiting for that sun that's about to set, where the lighting is absolutely right, trying to decide if I should be standing in the middle, trying to decide if I should stand up further to break up the space and move things around. But then all of these architectural things, which have always been so interesting to me, that beam going down my son's head, all are in the back of my mind, and I have to pull those off pretty quickly. And again, here I'm trying to get into the picture and have something real happen. God knows, I probably stepped on my son's foot, but it's something that I really wanted to try to see if I could do. And then I put myself in my own bedroom where I spend so much time and to try to um, try to really understand what that's like and what I seem like, and really trying to uh, and trying to learn about. Uh, what I look like and what I seem to be. I mean, this could take my whole life, but it's really quite a challenge. Um, you know, I'm going to keep on doing this. It's something, this is my other son, but I also, um, and I think this is quite strange, just his hair uh, that marks this certain time and this whole idea of, of parent and child respect that I've been um, dealing with from the very beginning is interesting. And this bare chest, this sort of Montaigne type figure that's standing there. And so I put myself with my sister, which uh, was definitely time to do. And um, I'm pleased with it. This is one of the easiest photographs I've ever taken. I literally just sort of fell down on her shoulder there. And it, it seems a very simple thing to do, but it took uh, until 1990 to do this. I, at this time, I had been working. I, in 8x10 and 4x5, these are still 4x5-foot photographs. And I really um, you know, didn't think too much about the structure of this, but I think the way that we're pushed down to that corner uh, seems to work right and seem um, sort of appropriate for the way um, that I felt in this situation. I, this, these are 8x10. I wanted to slow down. I wanted to look at these people I've been photographing for all these years. This is 1990. And really look hard. I've been, uh, I took a drawing class this year to really learn how to see better because there's so little time in taking a photograph in which you really can examine uh, the figure, the, the, the face, the head, the neck, and how people uh, move and act and react to each other. And um, I wanted this scale of five, uh, five feet to have the, the whole head fill that five foot scale. And yet again, I'm not sure about the space and what goes on and how to create the space between just these two faces. There's so much I've eliminated since the beginning with the interiors and the clothing. And so the one thing I sort of went on here was I had the screen door that I left open and th thought to myself, okay, well, at least that might bring the eye out a little bit. I'm very um, um, impressed and in awe of Chuck Close's uh, busts and Thomas Roof's work, which is just the face, just the head, nothing else in the background, and the challenge of trying to deal with that. And so this is uh, sort of thinking about that way of photographing one person alone. And here, just the, this background, instead of curtains and tables and antiques, um, this was a challenge dealing with this wonderful grid and this sort of uh, just two, two uh, tone sort of colors something very formal and very different from, from anything I've done. And uh, it really, I wa I'm still not sure uh, what I think of these, but, I, but they're, to me, much more interesting and much more uh, difficult for me to figure out while I'm photographing at them uh, and looking at them afterwards. So that is the kind of thing I want to set up for myself. And here again is this phenomena of um, the uh, the genes and the similarities between parents and their children. And here's Sheila again with her brother. Very simple, no uh, fancy stuff. The focus is something also I'm interested in dealing with now. Um, I, I've had out of focus and in focus uh, parts of the photographs from the very beginning. And that's quite a challenge because it can direct your attention in, in very different areas depending on how you want to deal with that focus. This is a little girl that was on the bed in the pink bedroom with her father five years later. And this is the family I've photographed two before 
But what interests me too is having two figures, two, two people, especially family members in one room, how they can be standing next to each other but also seem as if they were in two entirely different places. So again, that idea of the diptych of something happening on one piece of paper and yet being divided and having two scenes happening together. And that also the, the wonderful ambiguity between outside and inside has always been so very interesting to me. See, this is the same family I photographed five years before. So the changes in the family members is something that goes on. These are, this is the father and son in the photograph of the, of the, uh, that I called the son five years later, four years later. Um, and this, this photograph is, to me, um, I'm, I'm really pleased with this one. It's so simple. It's almost a grisaille. So in other words, uh, very little color for me, at least, to deal with. But this soft sort of background, this, I mean, barely anything in focus, <coughs> is something very new for me and very challenging. And, and uh, just the look, the glance, uh, again, the vantage point, where I put the camera, this, uh, the camera was a little bit lower looking up, all those decisions of where to stand, um, this, again, this dark line going down the middle, how these two figures are so close and yet maybe divided um, in, in uh, it, it just in, the, divided by the certain spaces that, that are photographic. And this photographic, I sort of go back to, um, this is 1990, to uh, the, uh, the narrative that has been through my work when you think of the Searsucker suits um, that I did in 1977. Here is 1990. Uh, this is so, much, so important to me, is the youth of today. What has happened to them? Um, how much will they listen to us? Can we dress them the way we want to? And will they do what we want them to do just because we have dressed them in, in a certain way? Will they rebel? Um, uh, just the gesture of that little boy, um, I mean, where does that gesture come from? Is that from media? Is that from photographs he's seen of, of Kennedy? Um, how do they relate to each other? Um, just the fact that they look so grown up and yet they are still little um, is, is quite strange. And here are two friends uh, uh, that I have wa I've always wanted to photograph. I wanted to show this kind of int intimacy with the other uh, people in my photographs, and obviously that is not so easy to do, but also this wonderful challenge of photographing the, the skin. And the, these friends were, were very relaxed in the situation, and uh, I felt as though they were just as much as part of my life as, as the rest of uh, the people in my pictures. And the photographing of, of men and women relationships is something I haven't done much of, and I'm beginning to think about it. But the idea of the photo, I don't know if you can see, but the woman here in the front is out of focus. The man in the background is, uh, is in focus. And usually in, in the history of photography, it's been the other way around. And I wanted to see what would happen as far as the relationship between these two were concerned in putting the person in the foreground out of focus. The decisions about where to look. Should she look into the camera? Should he look at her? Should he look at me? Are wonderful decisions that uh, really are exciting to think about when you're under that black, when I'm under the, the dark cloth. And uh, everything else is quite simple, but those things are really going around in my mind. This is Jan Groover and Bruce Boyce, two artists, uh, both living in New York, um, at least when this photograph was taken in 1991, last year. But the kind of, when I think about portraiture and uh, what makes a great portrait, uh, how much is just a great face, a great human being, how much is uh, what the photographer, the artist has done. And in this situation, I went in to photograph Jan, who I idealize, her work is so important to me as far as seeing photographically. And she just turned to me and said, how about this? And gave me this glance. Now that doesn't happen very often um, in, in photographic portraiture anyway, because most people don't really know who they are or what they're like enough to have that definite um, sense of, of, you know, how they should pose in order to have, have their photograph taken. And here um, is my, my love of the patterns, the Vuieres type patterns of patchwork quilting and the out of focus and in focus and the spaces behind. And all the different layers and squares of um, spaces of, uh, that are so wonderful to deal with. And uh, also 
trying to describe the relationship between, that's me up there in the, in the print dress, between me my, and my two friends. So that, um, that's, this is up the, la the latest work I've done. I just wanted to show you some of the other, the, the Whitney project that I did last year with the playwright Tina Howe. We, she wrote a play for me called Swimming, and then I sort of read the play about three times. It was about a mother of my age with two college kids that are sitting on the beach and talking about their lives. And I put the play in the back of my mind and, and photographed um, situations that really related to the play in a certain sense, but didn't illustrate it. These, were, these are nine original photographs that are in this beautifully bound book. Um, and there are certain scenes in the play that, are, that, for instance, have to do with the YMCA, but that can be also interpreted in many different ways. This book uh, can be seen at my dear friend and uh, uh, wonderful dealer agent, Janet Borden, who has helped me through my entire career and has uh, really been a wonderful per person to work with all this time. And the book can be seen at the gallery down in Broadway. This is about the trail. This was fun for me to do because it was kind of imaginary. Uh, it wasn't as emotional at all. It was like it was having fun for me and trying to do a kind of uh, play or movie myself. I used the people that um, you know, my friends and family, and did this kind of thing that I would have never done probably ordinarily, and just really had a good time. I then uh, was lucky enough through Janet to meet the Worcester group and photograph them. I don't know if you know who they are, but they're a wonderful uh, performing group that, that work out of the performing garage, and that's where Spalding Gray and Willem Dafoe uh, belong to. And this is Ron Vorder, who I think is one of the best actors going today. And they invited me to go down to the performing garage and photograph them while they were re rehearsing for their, their play uh, that's an ad adaptation of Chekhov's Three Sisters. And they are so crazy and so free and open that it, that it freed me to do whatever I want. Um, there were no sort of rules or any sort of uh, set, set sort of plans that I had to, um, to work with. I could do whatever I wanted. Nothing had to be, uh, no wires had to be hidden, no umbrellas had to be hidden. I didn't really know what was going on too much, but there are wonderful situations such as this is Willem Dafoe and a video screen of that woman over there. All this stuff happening at one time. I wanted to see if I could do the same kind of photograph that I ordinarily do as well in a situation that's so far into what I'm accustomed to. See, that's Willem Dafoe on the television there. These photographs, I blew up uh, two of them four by five feet that are at Janet's gallery too. And then um, so, uh, they, they were in Bomb magazine um, last year. And there's the cover that it was on last year. So that's all, and thank you for coming, and uh, I hope we have some good questions. Tina, you answered all my questions. <laughs> now, what did you learn? You said you learned something. What did you learn? Um, I hadn't seen as, uh, before anywhere near as much of the pre-82 work. Um, and I actually think some of it was pretty good, uh, especially the black and white work. Um, and. It was interesting to me to hear you talk about it uh, so much in, in terms of diagrams of family relationships. What do you mean by diagrams? Well, when you're talking about the, the you know, the relationship between this uh, this mother to this child, or the or the uh, the woman alone, or in, and the titles, oh. what is she going to do when she gets free? <laughs> uh, well, um, thank you. I, I f feel as if that that at that time, a lot of photographers were using um, words underneath their photographs because they were insecure about their images and they didn't hold strongly enough. And Dwayne Michaels did it 
the best and probably no one else can, could do it as well as he did it. And we all sort of were so influenced by him. We, we, I shouldn't speak for everybody, but we were pretty influenced by him. Nice. And uh, it was, it's funny to think that, you, that we, we probably underestimated the audience. And so and imagine in the 70s, most people uh, had not looked at art photography at all. And I was uh, very um, specific about what I wanted to, to be understood mm -hmm. and never felt that anybody that was looking, I would show these photographs in, in uh, workshops, nobody knew what I was talking about. And I was too embarrassed and too shy to say and insecure to say, well, this is about this man not being interested in that woman and the, I never would have said that tree is me split down the middle. I mean, how corny can you possibly get? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. What would you say then if um, if someone said that the work has become less sociological like that, interpersonal, and more psychological? Um, I think that's exactly what's happened. Um, uh, having my work be uh, described as sociological always was uh, great honor for me. I mean, anthropological and sociological, maybe, but because the way people, um, I mean, I watch people in a airports and families uh, traveling in situations, and it just absolutely fascinates me the way um, they gather together, what the father does, what the mother does. Those things will always be interesting to me. But I think um, as less information or less material information um, is in my pictures, the interpretation is more ambiguous. And so I guess then, therefore, not a sociological. I mean, it could be, but not as easy to decipher in that way. Um, it, one of my questions before the talk, but all, well, see, all of my questions that I wrote down before the talk now seem completely irrelevant. <laughs> uh, but one of them was, um, do you ever think, while uh, as you're planning pictures that you might do, uh, sort of the way a, a photojournalist might think about uh, covering all the bases of a particular subject, if you're going to photograph the steel plant or something like that, uh, do you ever think of, well, I should photograph this too because that's part of that life so that the whole uh, makes some kind of total sense. Can you give me an example? Because are you doing well, you did the bathroom, for example, yeah. and you've done, you know, oh. there, and you've oh, done birthday finishing parties up and you the, the novel, you mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Yes, exactly. Because I'll, I'll think. Um, oh, it doesn't really not not really thinking of characters, but yes. Um, for instance, I haven't really taken photographs of male-female relationships or romance, for instance. Um, that's something, I don't know if you mean that, but that's, the, that's something sure, that's I'd like exactly to do. exactly what I mean. Or we were talking the other day about photographing the people in my pictures in working situations. Well, that's something that would, I, I really would like to do. But also, um, those are sort of too easy for me as far as subject matter is concerned. And I know that the hard parts are um, much simpler things than that, of sticking a person by themselves with all, without any of those goodies around and really looking at the human being and what the face is like, what the eyes are like, um, and how that person is just all alone by themselves. That's much more difficult. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I usually do, I would, I would do both things, you know, the fun stuff and then the hard stuff maybe too at the same time. Actually, one of the things that I enjoyed a lot about the talk was your um, going back and back and back to the simple things like, should she be looking here, or should uh -huh. the, where should the plane of focus be, and all the rest of that, which kept uh, reminding everybody that even when all of the whole main thing is put together, whether or not the picture works depends on such tiny decisions like that. I thought that was really oh, interesting. Yeah. And those, I mean, those are the challenges that uh, hurt my brain the most. <laughs> um, and I think that one of the most difficult decisions is where should the eyes go? But I think this has been in the history uh, of portraiture throughout. Um, uh, that might be the most important decision. 
Mm -hmm. And then what does that mean? And this is what's going on in my head the whole time. What does that mean if that person looks into the camera or looks at, you know, many, many, I could go on under the dark cloth for one frame, maybe if my, you know, stamina held up for an hour making that one decision. Um. The Actually, there's a question from the audience that's a little bit related to, well, it's a little bit related to a question I wanted to ask you, which is, um, uh, the question I wanted to ask you was, uh, how do your subjects respond to your pictures? And this one is a little more precise, is, does your mounting celebrity alter your subject's response to you? Yes, definitely. Who asked that? <laughs> Why, um, yes, yes. Um, because I, I, I don't know if my family remembers this, but I remember the pictures from 1979, 1980 of going to my brother's house. I bet he doesn't even remember this. And setting up a slide projector and slides and showing my family my first, and this is serious making of art. And I knew they didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And they, I mean, they've been patient. They've listened to me. I'm very authoritative, though. And uh, we all, we like, I mean, everybody likes to be together and has a good time. But I've demanded much more of everybody. Each year I demand more and more time-wise uh, and more difficult work. And I think because of the result, of course it's much more fun. Now, some people might, so, there have only been one or two subjects that do not want to be exposed to the public. But most of the time, I think, uh, I think it's been much easier for me. And uh, the, the only hard part is if the photographs aren't successful, uh, a lot of times they feel that they have failed. Which is, and I feel I have failed, and that part is too bad. So okay. in other words, you don't get the problem of people wanting to be less in the pictures because they're going to be seen no. a lot. They want, them, they want to be more in the pictures. I, I think so. I shouldn't mm -hmm. speak for them, but I would think so. This is the the follow up to that from the audience is did your friend Sheila speak to you again after you took her picture in the garden? <laughs> I tell you what she said to show what she's like and also to show uh, what I think most of the people are like that I photograph. First of all, I don't have time and can't tolerate vanity. I mean, we all care about what we look like a lot of the time, but. I don't have time if someone says I don't look good or uh, um, it's too, I, I, you know, I want to get to work here. And I show the results to everybody and rarely everybody's been pretty good sport about it. Now Sheila is probably the most unvain human being that has ever hit the face of the earth. And she saw that photograph. It's the first time when I got that contact sheet back that I, I felt scared, especially when I blew it up big. And I felt scared for Sheila, and I thought, oh, God. And I, I, even though I knew her, well, I showed it to her, and I said, okay, Sheila, what do you think? And she said, oh, teen, that's just what I look like to my weeds. <laughs> so that shows, I mean, you got to love her. <laughs> she didn't care. She owns the picture. It's in her living room. It doesn't, it's totally inappropriate to her life, and it's sitting there, <laughs> gaping at her family. <laughs> Uh, another one. Your photographs can be voyeuristic experiences for the viewer. Do you feel this way now that you're on the other side of the camera? No, I don't. Be, uh, no, because I'm too curious um, to figure out uh, what's going on, and the, the, the puzzle and the game is so inter interesting to me. No, and if I, uh, for instance, if I photograph myself when I look like shit, I don't care. Just if it's an interesting photograph, that's what's important. I mean, if it's if it's uh, something horrible, then, you know, I wouldn't. We can imagine what that would be. I wouldn't, foot, uh, exp you know, print it up. But no. <laughs> that's right. You do. You can always throw it away. Right. <laughs> Terrible. Oh yeah. Exactly. Uh, but what about the first part of that question? Your photographs can be voyeuristic ex experiences for the viewer. Do I think that mm -hmm. they are? Hmm. Okay, what does voyeuristic mean? Uh, that means sort of peeking. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. You're not supposed to see this, but let me look anyway, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, Without the involvement of the voyeur, as the voyeur remains hidden. 
Okay, just a minute. This think about that. Um, well, I, I don't think they are. Um, mainly because they are my life. Um, and I don't see any difference between just being there, being with everybody, and photographing them. I know. Except now everybody can. When, when you put the picture on the wall, mm -hmm. all sorts of people who, 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 of course, weren't there and never would be there get to see it. Get, get to see at least the picture. Well, I think about that, but, uh, and I've always said that I would never um, um, do anything that would take away the dignity of the people that I photograph. Um, so I guess that, that that is in my mind. Um, but that's also what I'm like anyway. So I, no, the idea of being voyeuristic doesn't enter my mind. It just, it doesn't. Um, what I said earlier uh, in the introduction about the, was a thought really that, that really only came to me this morning when I was writing that about um, the pictures not meaning the same thing to, to everybody. Right. What do you think about that? Um, do you think it's true? I think it's definitely true, and uh, many times I've gotten uh, <coughs> feedback from people who have interpreted my photographs in an entirely different way than I have meant them to be. And in the beginning, that was that was very hard for me to be misunderstood. Was very hard for me to accept, and uh, I've gotten used to it and understand how that can be so that everybody comes with their own excess baggage to, to what they to the way they look at the work. And a lot of times, um, actually, very good friends have said, "But Tina, you have good intentions. Your work, uh, you, uh, in your work, you want it to be optimistic. You want it to be about bringing the family together. Um, you want good things to happen." And yet, in a lot of the photographs, it looks like there's a lot of tension, a lot of disharmony. And m my answer to that, and uh, my answer still is, "We're getting there. Be patient." At least these people are standing in this room together at the same time. They're this close. That's pretty good for now. Just wait. We'll get there. You know, um, and also part of, uh, for instance, the picture of Sheila or uh, my mother and sister that look sort of have, have these strange expressions. Well, that's just part of the, the, uh, the relationship and the communication. And the, the family in which the father's sitting on the steps and looking like th this, well, it's called the conversation. And it can be said that maybe some families communicate and converse, screaming and yelling at each other. But my feeling for that is at least they're talking together and they're, they're saying something. Um, maybe a question that goes along with that. The, um, and it's also related to the earlier, earlier notion that the pictures have gotten less anthropological and more psychological. In the, I was very much struck by how much in the earliest pictures you had an extremely specific idea about exactly what the picture meant. Um, are your own feelings now about what the pictures mean as strong now or as specific? Well, I, I try to have a specific narrative in mind only because I think at least uh, that might um, sort of seep in a little bit to, to the intention. But it depends because uh, I've, I've photographed now in, in different ways. Um, sometimes I'm, I decide I want to do a very formal portrait of one person alone. That will be that will not have a, a definite narrative. The, the specific thing in mind there is basically is how do I feel about this person? That's something I think I forgot to say, is how I feel about these people. Um, after, uh, you know, let's say 1981, 82, um, when I got in closer to uh, individuals, is very important uh, and very, very much a part of what this is all about. That's almost the reason. Um, I've got to show how I care about these people. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in photographing my sister, that this is the main reason. Um, another question from the audience. Uh, does, did your mother's modeling career influence your decision to appear in front of the camera lens in the late 80s? No. No, I think my mother's modeling career, career when I think back, that I was surrounded by not only um, very beautifully kept scrapbooks. My grandmother kept wonderful scrapbooks of my, model, my mother's entire modeling career. 
And then my mother kept scrapbooks of our, of our family scrapbooks of our, our childhood and their whole lives. And that was always something that we loved to look through. And only now when I think back is I'm sure that those photographs and those family snapshots or those party snapshots influenced me. And then looking, I mean, the photographs of my mother, a lot of them were done by Honecke, Hune, Horst, etc. So there were really uh, beautiful quality photographs that were there during my childhood. So that influenced me, but not me being in. Oh, is that part of the why you decided to do the oh, tape think, about Horst? I think, I think so, you know, some of it. And also what, what uh, was in the back of my mind when I started doing interiors because of his house and garden interiors, in fact, in a way, all I could say to myself, okay, I, this can't look like a horse, this can't look like a horse, uh, because he, one of his trademarks was having this out of focus uh, something in the foreground, which is something that I've always loved to do. It's just a wonderful gimmick, and I would try to get away from that because he did that first. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other uh, I, uh, plans for tapes after you're done with Jan? I don't ever, I don't think I ever want to do it ever again. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, uh, uh, in a way, I think about that in my own work and how much fun it would be to use actors to just pay people and tell them what to do and say, you do exactly what I want. Uh, well, in documentary work, um, at least of that nature, you are uh, at the command of that subject, which is, you know, not there's no script. You don't know what that person's going to feel like and do. And that can make it exciting. But a lot of times it's... Do you, ever, do you ever think of, of uh, hiring actors and completely fabricating the, you know, no. renting the location, uh, dressing the, you know? No, because uh, the, the, feeling, the feeling wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. The feelings, the uh, emotional um, stress attack, um, you know, nervous breakdown feeling that I have when I take the pictures, which has to do with my feelings for the people, mm -hmm. would be... Um, not there. But I think about the people that I've photographed and saying, come on, let's have some fun. Let's, let's uh, do some drama here and think up something totally outrageous to do. I haven't told them that yet or asked them that mm -hmm. yet. But. It doesn't matter if it works, does it? <laughs> what does work mean, though? <laughs> well, if the picture's persuasive, there's a picture. Well, I, don't, I don't mean. I don't means. mean. I don't mean. I'm not trying to talk you into hiring models. I'm saying that if, with the <laughs> you want to be <laughs> with the condition, no, with the condition that you need to photograph the people that you're that you know, very well, when then you can. That's all I was saying. And if you're going well, to stage direct, what's what's interesting is I was talking to uh, to Chuck close today about artificial um, artificiality and. Truth. I don't know if those were the words that we used, and he made me uh, think about this—the uh, difference in that you can, you can learn about what what reality is maybe by looking at artificiality. And so I started thinking about this: that maybe in creating these theatrical um, situations, something might happen that's actually uh, connected to to the to the reality. Who knows? I, I'm not going to do this, so who knows? Probably. So what's next? What are you hungry to do? I don't know. I, you know, people ask me that all the time, but um, uh, I usually get, it has to do with just getting under the dark cloth and looking, and there's just so many questions that I haven't answered for myself. Uh, usually visually, but the visual goes along with the, the psychological. And I mean, it's, it makes me nervous because it'd be much easier if I said I was into uh, uh, pears and apples this year, black and white, two inch by two inch photographs. You know, that'd be much easier. <laughs> no way. So, thank I you. Think, I think we're done. Do you have anything more to, that you no. want to add? Thank you for coming. Thank you. It's a thank real you. pleasure. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.